attorney, a barrister, uh, as I said, the author of uh, at least three books that deal with the um, assassination of Martin Luther King. He was a friend and associate of Dr. King, particularly the last year of his life. In fact, Bill, as a photojournalist in Vietnam, uh, brought to Dr. King uh, through photographs and text and, and just his, uh, his witness the reality of what was taking place in Vietnam at the time and is um, probably more instrumental than he'd want to admit, but probably majorly instrumental in having Dr. King uh, adopt his uh, uh, more uh, an overt anti-war uh, stance, which he then articulated in his famous Riverside speech, um, why I opposed the war in Vietnam, uh, on a, a year before his assassination in April of, of uh, 1968. Um, all I can say to you about the gentleman I'm, up, I'm about to, to introduce is that if those of us who are, uh, um, have been in the struggle and who have moments of where we feel worn down, um, that we need to get inspiration from people like Bill who have never let up, um, who maintain the fire, who maintain the vision and clarity, um, but who also maintain a sense of uh, strategy and tactics as to where we need to go. Um, Bill, tonight um, I've asked him to come in and share some of his thoughts about his relationship with Dr. King, um, some of the circumstances regarding his work uh, in uncovering the truth of his assassination, um, but more importantly, or as important, where we go from here. Um, we have had discussions um, pertaining to a, a new poor people's campaign, or as I like to refer to it, a 21st century poor people's campaign, which envis envisions a million people and upwards coming to Washington, D.C. and saying the show is over. We're reorganizing this country on the, uh, on the basis of a new agenda. Uh, this will be a global campaign. We're going to talk some more about it in the Q&A. We have a document here that we want to share with you. Um, so without further ado, I'm very honored and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you will feel uh, uh, just wonderful being here in his presence. Um, Frank asked me to come here and give you a bit of the background, the history of uh, my involvement in, uh, uh, with Martin King and the, the struggle for social justice and uh, human rights in America. And I, I'm, I'm so, sort of reluctant and, and because I think I, I don't want to bore people with um, um, a message that they've heard and a history that they've heard. Uh, Frank assures me that there will be a number of people in this group who simply don't know that story and haven't heard it, so that I should kind of summarize what has gone on uh, over the last uh, nearly 45 years, and it's really that long a period of time. Uh, so I'll, with your indulgence, I'll try to do that, to give you the framework and the background so you can understand why um, I've, I'm here and why I am uh, uh, saying what I'm saying about the future of this great republic and what, is, uh, what has happened to it uh, up to the present time. I was a kid journalist in Vietnam uh, back in 1966. And I went there not knowing uh, anything really about the war but being unhappy uh, about the absence of information that was forthcoming. I didn't know, for example, that uh, there was uh, a me lie that was going to take place and that Cy Hirsch was going to take a year. Share with you. Um, so without further ado, I'm very honored and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you will feel uh, uh, just wonderful being here in his presence. Um, Frank asked me to come here and give you a bit of the background, the history of uh, my involvement in, uh, uh, with Martin King and the, the struggle for social justice and uh, human rights in America. And I, I'm, I'm so, sort of reluctant and, and because I think I, I don't want to bore people with um, um, a message that they've heard and a history that they've heard. Uh, Frank assures me that there will be a number of people in this group who simply don't know that story and haven't heard it, so that I should kind of summarize what has gone on uh, over the last uh, nearly 45 years, and it's really that long a period of time. 
so I'll, with your indulgence, I'll try to do that to give you the framework and the background so you can understand why um, I've, I'm here and why I'm uh, uh, saying what I'm saying about the future of this great republic and what, is, uh, what has happened to it uh, up to the present time. I was a kid journalist in Vietnam uh, back in 1966. And I went there not knowing uh, anything really about the war, but being unhappy uh, about the absence of information that was forthcoming. I didn't know, for example, that uh, there was uh, a me lie that was going to take place and that Cy Hirsch was going to take a year in his presence. Um, Frank asked me to come here and give you a bit of the background, the history of uh, my involvement in, uh, uh, with Martin King and the the struggle for social justice and uh, human rights in America. And I, I'm, I'm so, sort of reluctant and, and because I think I, I don't want to bore people with um, um, a message that they've heard and a history that they've heard. Uh, Frank assures me that there'll be a number of people in this group who simply don't know that story and haven't heard it, so that I should kind of summarize what has gone on uh, over the last uh, nearly 45 years, and it's really that long a period of time. Uh, so I'll, with your indulgence, I'll try to do that, to give you the framework and the background so you can understand why um, I've, I'm here and why I'm uh, uh, saying what I'm saying about the future of this great republic and what, is, uh, what has happened to it uh, up to the present time. I was a kid journalist in Vietnam uh, back in 1966. And I went there not knowing uh, anything really about the war, but being unhappy uh, about the absence of information that was forthcoming. I didn't know, for example, that uh, there was uh, a me lie that was going to take place and that Cy Hirsch was going to take a year of struggle to get that truth out to the Americans. I also didn't know that uh, for every me lie uh, that we knew about, there were at least a hundred others that were perpetrated. So I went uh, <laughs> wide-eyed, open-mouthed, bushy-tailed into Saigon, got uh, uh, credentialized by the, uh, uh, by the CIA, effectively, who Commander Madison, who was a CIA guy, credentialized all of the uh, the journalist, and I was a freelancer. And, uh, but I came with letters of recommendation uh, that I had no business having, but somehow because of connections I was able to get. One was from DeWitt Wallace, who was the founder of Reader's Digest. The other was from uh, the Monsignor who ran Catholic Relief Services here in New York. I was neither a Catholic nor a reader of Reader's Digest, but <laughs> my... Uh, my uh, background enabled me to know people who knew these people, and um, uh, they vouched for me, so I got these letters. I was a safe person. As a safe person, I had my credentials, and I went there. I went um, into Saigon and then spent very little time there. I wanted to be out in the, uh, in the country and try to understand the impact of the war on the civilian population. That was my, uh, my personal mission. So I, I was in the Central Highlands a lot, in, in Da Nang, and played coup, and, um, and I recorded and filmed, uh, still filmed, um, atrocities and deaths. I never uh, wrote a word <laughs> or tran uh, uh, interpreted or did anything with those tapes or those photographs. None of them was developed in Vietnam, only when I returned to the United States. I, I had a problem uh, some several weeks into the stay there. We, we were hit going into play coup on a uh, landing, and I'd injured my back and, uh, and um, had to go back to Saigon. 
And some uh, friends uh, said, well, can you come along and you know, just relax for a bit? And I did, and uh, the anger took over at a social gathering and a Vietnamese woman who somehow affixed herself to me um, uh, uh, got a picture of what I was seeing in the country. The next morning, uh, dear Commander Madison uh, invited me to visit with him. <laughs> And I went down and I saw him and uh, he said, you know, we're worried about you because you're out there. You could get killed. We've lost uh, 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 a good young American journalist before. Um, you don't attend our uh, five o'clock uh, briefings every day. You don't know what's going on from our perspective. You're, saying, you're in shelters and orphanages and hospitals. And I said, yes, that's where I want to be. He said, well, we're worried because you know the NLF, um, the Kong, you know, can hit you at any time and uh, we don't want to, you know, lose any more young Americans than we have to. So we think um, maybe it's time for you to go home. And I said, well, maybe it is. But if I, before I go home, I'd really like to go into Tainin. And uh, he said, why do you want to go to Tainin? He said, the Kong control that area. I said, well, there's a leprosarium there. And I want to visit that leprosarium. He said, why would you want to visit a leprosarium? I said, well, because you know, I believe that you get to know a lot about people and movements by the way they treat the most degraded amongst them. And so I'd like to see how those lepers are treated in Tainan. And he didn't understand that at all. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, ah, he said, uh, well, he said, so what do you have in mind? I said, well, I need a chopper to go in there, obviously, because they control all the air. He said, ah, oh, we're not going to, we can't give you a chopper. But what we'll do is we'll give you a Jeep. We'll give you a Jeep with a driver, and um, he'll take you through, and you can do that, and then you get out of here. So I talked to some of my friends in the uh, voluntary agency circuit, and, um, and, uh, and they said, um, Get out of here now. What are you doing? He said, the handwriting's on the wall. The last guy they gave a jeep to was found by the side of the road. They blamed it on the Kong. He had been machine gunned and he was dead. You know, forget about it. Why don't you just, just leave? Just leave if you want to leave with your life and anything that you can tell. So I left Vietnam. Uh, shortly thereafter, came back to the States, was in traction for a while in a local hospital in uh, Yonkers, New York, and then um, began to write and began to use the photographs and the, the, the films. They, they uh, for the most part, uh, did not appear, uh, in, and of course, in any mainstream media, but they appeared um, in a magazine called Ramparts. And some of you may recall Ramparts, and others of you may never have heard of Ramparts. <laughs> San Francisco publication. Uh, at uh, Hinkle, Warren Hinkle uh, published and Bob Shear, who I guess is still out there uh, writing for one or another, I think the Chronicle at this point, Bob was the editor of it. And um, they put me up for two weeks uh, here in this city at the Algonquin Hotel and I just wrote and they had the photographs and they signed an editor and we put out this piece in January of 1967. January 1967, issue of Ramparts was called The Children of Vietnam. And it was a devastating piece because it told a, a horrific story. Well, Martin King was a subscriber to Ramparts. And he was on his way to a uh, holiday in Jamaica and he was going through his mail at the Atlanta airport, so said Bernard Lee, his bodyguard, and he came across this issue of Ramparts. And he started going through it and he saw the photographs of the atrocities. And um, it visibly, so Bernard said, upset him. And he, uh, he pushed away the food that Bernard had brought to him to eat at the airport. But I said, what's the matter, Martin? You're not hungry? You don't eat the food? And Martin said, no. Nah. He said, I can never again, Bernard, enjoy food <laughs> until we stop this war. Uh, 
this is, this is very difficult for me <laughs> because um, I didn't know Martin at all. Uh, you know, Frank said, you know, maybe I knew him. So I didn't know him at all until that last year of his life. And he asked to meet with me. I opened the files to him, which were far more extensive than what he had seen, and he wept. I met him at, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He delivered a sermon at Brown University in the chapel, and he was, um, we were going to, up to Cambridge. And, um, thank you. And he, um, uh, he asked me to, to, just to show him all this. I showed it to him, and he wept in the back seat of that car. We were going there to open Vietnam summer. And uh, he, um, he was visibly moved by the whole thing, and that really turned him. He had always instinctively opposed this war, I think going back into the early 60s he had. Can't take credit for that. But this was the final straw, I think. So he delivered the speech uh, at Riverside on April 4, 1967. I spoke with him about 1 o'clock in the morning after that speech, and he said, you know, they're all going to turn their backs on me now. The whole civil rights movement is going to turn their backs because they're, con they're, they're convinced that the Johnson administration is going to withdraw all its money from uh, social action programs, and I'm going to stand alone, and I'm going to be maligned. And, of course, he was. Editorially, the New York Times attacked him. They, all of the mainstream media attacked Martin that point. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm going to need you and people like you now really um, outside of this mainstream movement to get involved and to support my effort and what I'm going to try to do, which is end this war. So he asked me uh, to, to head an organization which was a coalition back, and this is all historical stuff, and I don't want to bore you with it all, but I mean, it is the historical foundation. Uh, a coalition of organizations that became a, really became the Peace and Freedom Movement, and it was called the National Conference for New Politics. So I became its executive director in 1967, and we began to develop a nationwide uh, convention uh, that was going to set this country on a different course. We built this organization, and um, Martin King stood behind it. We had a convention in uh, Chicago at the Palmer House Hotel in uh, Labor Day of 1967. And 5,000 delegates, 5,000 delegates representing organizations from all over this country gathered in that Palmer House room. And their purpose was to build a, and develop and give birth to a new movement, a united movement that uh, united Fannie Lee Hamer, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, uh, Ben Spock, uh, an insane nuclear group, all of these, you know, from the liberals, the left liberals, to the communists and the socialist workers party and all of these organizations under one roof with a common manifesto. When that convention started, a black caucus was formed. This was the first black caucus ever formed. All, every black delegate who came in was corralled and put into a meeting room with other black delegates. And so there was a formidable black caucus that was going to, we thought, stand for and argue uh, the positions of uh, black liberation movement, the Panthers, and SNCC, and the rest of them. We didn't know the genesis of that black caucus. We were too naive to understand what was going on. Martin delivered the keynote address at the convention. I introduced him and sat down. Uh, Dick Gregory was there, Ben Spock was on the other side, and here's Martin delivering his speech, and over my shoulder comes a note. The black hand, there's this note. I take this note, and the note says, get him out of here after he speaks, or we will kidnap him. We will hold him hostage, 
and embarrass him before the world. And this is from the Black Caucus. So, Martin finished his speech. I pulled him aside with Andy and others. And I, I, I said, I don't want to tell you, but I think you've got to get out of here because I think there is a very hostile group that somehow uh, is going to embarrass you and disrupt this whole convention. Martin um, accepted that advice and left. When he left, the unifier walked out the door because he was a unifier. He would bring people together. The caucus existed for the purpose of separating and dividing. We didn't know it at the time. We would learn years later that the caucus was being led, orchestrated, by Blackstone Rangers from the south side of Chicago and others in the payroll of Mayor Daley and the U.S. Department of the Interior and Lyndon Johnson's organization. We didn't know that. This was well done. I mean, these guys were so skillful and they had all the rhetoric and they co-opted all of the black revolutionary movement for the purpose of subverting it and separating it. We didn't know that. Bill Coffin and I sat the end of that, at the end of the plenary sessions where resolutions were forced through by the caucus solely designed to drive away all of the money, all of the funding of this movement, a lot of which was Jewish money. And so the resolutions were heavily anti-Semitic and they were being pushed through and forced through and you could see the guilt dripping from the walls as it went through. And Coffin and I Billy Coffin and I s sat there and said, Jesus, what's going on here? We didn't know. We thought this was a legitimate um, uh, cleavage that maybe we couldn't bridge somehow. It ended the movement. Yes, NCMP continued, but it focused on local organizing and, uh, and uh, it, it was no longer a force. It was no longer a force. Um, however, Martin King continued his, uh, his efforts throughout. He gave his speech at uh, Riverside on the 4th. He spoke at the UN. I introduced him there again on the 15th of uh, April, uh, 1967. And he was determined to uh, wage an effort to stop this war. Well... The last time I saw him alive was in um, Bishop, uh, not Bishop, but I'm sorry, was um, in, in the Union Theological, John Bennett's study at Union Theological Seminary. And um, that conversation with, with Martin, myself, uh, Andy Young, and Ben Spock focused on the issues of violence and nonviolence. And um, his enormous respect for Malcolm X because Malcolm was an urban revolutionary leader. Martin was from a religious Southern Baptist background in the South. And Martin realized in the South that, in his perception, that the only way to, to oppose this war and this system um, was through nonviolence, because they had suffered so much in the way of violence and, 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 and loss, and they didn't have any capability. Nonviolence was his commitment flowing from Gandhi. Whereas Malcolm in the North had a different perspective, and Martin had come up to the North, as some, many of you may know, knowing his history, and he, he was in Cicero for a period of time. He tried to have an impact, and he failed. He just didn't really understand the degree of hatred and violence that, it had, that existed you know, in the North. But he, he knew that, he knew that Red, he knew that uh, Malcolm did know that, and he had a great respect. So a lot of that conversation was a dialogue in John Bennett's study between him and, and myself about uh, violence and nonviolence. And he was adamant about nonviolence. He, he stood firmly that way. And one of the things that disappointed me most, I mean, I'm totally disappointed with, with the Obama administration and all of its, uh, its illusions and illusory uh, 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 
promises that have, I, I think, conned so many people in this country was, is, was Obama's Nobel speech prize, where he tended to shove to the side Gandhi and King's commitment to nonviolence. They really can't work. I am now, as a head of state, I have to be concerned about the national security of people. I have to be concerned about that. And it's nice to talk about nonviolence, but you cannot effectively see nonviolence working in terms of changing power structures. Well, what he did, of course, was totally misrepresent the, the whole history of Gandhi in India. Because as, much, as, as many as the, as the Brits could kill, more stood up. And ultimately, it was Gandhi and nonviolence that forced the British to leave India. And this was their pearl. This was their pearl, their treasure. And they left because of Gandhi and nonviolence. And as much as he, as he criticized in a, in a, indirectly King by pushing aside this concept of nonviolence and advocating the necessity of violence in our time, he, he didn't really give credit to the, the structural change that resulted from Martin King's enormous impact, nonviolent impact, in terms of the civil rights movement in the South. And by saying, you know, Germany, uh, you could never beat Hitler with nonviolence. It, ha it had to be the troops and the guns to defeat this monster. Well, what he didn't say or take into account was the fact that nonviolent movement in Germany never came together. It didn't exist. It never had a chance. It was never unified. You all are familiar, many of you are familiar with Pastor Niemöller's speech. You know. He said, when they came for the labor union leaders and workers, I didn't say anything because I'm not a labor union. I'm not a worker. And when they came uh, for the communists, I didn't say anything because I'm not a communist. The socialists, I didn't say anything. But when they came and they started parading and attacking the homosexuals and the gay movement, I didn't say anything because I'm not gay and I'm not homosexual. And when they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything because I'm not Jewish. Ah, oh, when they came for me, <laughs> there was no one left to support. That was a movement that never got together. There was a nonviolent movement, potentially in Germany, that could have throttled and shut down that economy and could have taken on Hitler. But it never was unified and never was tried. So it's not fair to condemn the concept of nonviolence and the use of nonviolence strategically the way uh, this president uh, did in his, his Nobel Prize speech. Anyway, in that dialogue in, in John Bennett's study, um, and Martin made it very clear where he stood. And uh, I heard it many times from Jim Lawson, who was his main theoretician and expert on Gandhi. Uh, he never wavered in terms of nonviolence. He respected Malcolm. He knew what happened in, uh, in Chicago, uh, you know, when uh, Panthers were killed in their beds by Chicago police. He knew all of that. He still didn't believe that the proper answer was other than mass, mass mobilization of human beings who were committed to nonviolence. And so he, and he never, never wavered in that. And I, I have to be in, in increasingly uh, uh, wary of, uh, of those who uh, attack him because of that, uh, of that commitment. Anyway, we went through uh, 67. Um, a decision had been made much earlier in his life to kill him. That he was actually singled out in the late, mid to late 50s um, uh, by the forces who run this country and who had him w looked at and well targeted. There was uh, to be a, a, an assassination on the Selma March. 
they had a military sniper ready to take him out, and he turned the wrong way, went across the bridge. That sniper was also a part of a backup group in Memphis on the day he was killed. But he, he struggled through that last year of his life, uh, uh, attempting to oppose the war and do what he had to do. The second and the most important thing that emerged from that conversation I had with him was his total commitment, total commitment to the Poor People's Campaign. He said to me, you know what the two roads to power are? I said, yes, historically. He said, then you know they are money and numbers. And if you don't have the money, you have to have the numbers or get out of the game. He said, we don't have the money, but we sure as hell can have the numbers. And that's where was born the idea of this poor people's campaign in uh, Washington, D.C., where he was going to bring, at that time, they were talking about half a million people to D.C. Uh, to live, not march, marches are great for personal expression and, and uh, that type of catharsis. They don't do anything in terms of changing. Encampments. The same philosophy that Picture the Homeless has in terms of taking property, he advocated in terms of building a city, a tent city in the shadow of the Washington Memorial and staying there. And every day, people from all over the country going and visiting their congressmen and their senators and saying to them, you must put back into the budget all these funds that have been removed because of the war. That was, that was the major goal and mission that Martin King had that last year of his life. He was opposed in that by Jesse Jackson. And uh, I have no time for Jesse whatsoever. And that will come out very heavily in the third book that I, I have in preparation. There's a trilogy on this case for me. And the third book will clearly demonstrate where Jesse was coming from, who Jesse really has been all of his political career. From the time he left South Carolina with a letter from Strom Thurmond introducing him to Richard Daly when he moved to Chicago, which most people don't know ever happened. That's Jesse Jackson. Um, it gets much worse, but that's, that's Jesse. There, so he was, Martin was adamant about this, couldn't understand. One point, only time he ever lost his temper with anyone, I've been told by people who were at the meeting, was with Jesse, he said, Jesse, what are you doing? You want to form your own organization, go form it. You want to work with us, work with us. But stop this obstruction. That was his goal, to bring down the masses. And I believe, frankly, that was the major reason they killed him. Not the war. The war was important. War was very important. Because it was providing billions of dollars to uh, Brown and Root who were the favorites of Lyndon Johnson. Going back to the Roosevelt days, you know, Roosevelt gave Lyndon his first dam that Brown and Root built. So Johnson, Johnson had a real investment in the Brown and Root type of operations, and they had, there was a $1.2 or $3 billion um, uh, deep, uh, deep dredging operation at uh, Camran Bay that they were involved in doing. The war was creating billionaires all already back at, the, at that time. And so that was very important, because they were going to lose that money. They were going to lose that money. And so that upset them. But it was, in my view, the serious challenge of the march on Washington and the encampment in Washington is why they killed him. Because they saw that as the major threat to the structure, the structure they had created and that was run in America. They saw there almost was a revolution in France. A hundred cities in the United States had burned that year. They were convinced Martin King would lose control of his half a million people when they didn't get the uh, largesse back from the Congress 
and that the more radical elements would take over and they would have a revolution they couldn't put down. They couldn't put them down. If it wasn't for Andre Malraux, the French Revolution in 68 wouldn't have been put down, but the Gaulle followed his very guided advice and they were able to alienate, separate the communist labor unions from the students and they were able to put down that revolution. But in the United States, the military, the military was convinced that would not happen. That was a commonly shared view. And it had to do with the fact that um, th there is power in numbers. And that was what was going, that was what was going to uh, come to the surface. So he, he had that vision that last year. And I think without doubt that made it necessary for them uh, to kill him. And they did on the 4th of April, 1968. They got him. He came into Memphis to support the garbage workers. Um, there was a, uh, on the 28th of, uh, uh, 28th of March, there was a disruption. A march he had became violent. That was provoked again by the Blackstone Rangers and some, some folks out of St. Louis. Um, it was blamed on a local group called the Invaders that had nothing to do with it. He was rushed uh, to uh, the uh, Rivermont Hotel, which is a um, Holiday Inn Hotel. In that hotel, every room was bugged. They had over 17 microphones. They had them on the balcony outside. They had a relay station on the roof. They had them even in the bathroom. Everything he did and said was recorded. You know, I learned all of this because uh, I was able to uh, befriend a member of Memphis Police Department Intelligence who had since retired, who was the guy who brought the coffee and donuts to the people who were running the operation. So they, 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 um, they knew everything he was doing. They had infiltrated his own movement. Uh, he had, he had uh, uh, traitors r right next to him all the time. One of them knocked on his door, 10 minutes to 6, as he was supposed to do, to bring him out. That same man, Reverend Billy Kyles, has lied to this day, saying he was in the room with Martin for the last 25, 30 minutes of his life. Built a career out of this. Never was in the room. Knocked on the door. Martin came to it. He was to have dinner, a barbecue dinner at Kyle's house that night. He spoke to him for a few seconds, closed the door. Kyle's went down the balcony. Here's the door. Went down that side of the balcony and stood there for a long time. I always wondered why Billy Kyle's stayed so far away when Martin came out and stood on the balcony. Never could figure that out. It took me quite a long time because Billy was great for photo ops and he'd come up and he stayed far away. I read the police surveillance report that, and put the guy on the stand who compiled it to document that Kyle, yes, did this, called him out, and went down the balcony. Um, they had him set up in every which way. His room was changed. He wasn't supposed to be a 306. He was supposed to be down in the 202, the lower level, which was a guarded area. But that, that was changed. Uh, by a, um, a phone call. So he was doing truly set up and killed. Um, but at that time, 68, we all thought they had the right guy. We didn't know anything any different. There was this white guy in this Mustang that went driving away after dropping a bundle and had a rifle in that bundle. Didn't know anything about this. Nine years later, Abernathy called me and he said, can we kept in touch over there? And he said, yeah, he said, I like you. I'd like to go hear you interrogate Ray about a lot of issues that I don't think have ever been resolved. And I said, Ralph, what are you talking about? I thought he went round the bend. I said, Ralph, you think they have the right guy? He said, I, I, uh, I don't know. He said, I, want you. I said, Ralph, I know nothing about the case. Hadn't looked at it. Didn't want to look at it. We buried Martin. In, uh, in Atlanta, Bobby was running uh, for the presidency at that point. I had been Bobby's citizen's chairman as a, as a kid, again, Westchester County, New York, Republican area. And um, Bobby invited us up to his, uh, his room. I didn't go. Uh, Julian Bond and Spock and all the others went. I said, I'm through with politics. I don't have more to do with, it, with this. Uh, and uh, I didn't like Bobby when I ran his campaign in Westchester. I found him arrogant and out of touch with uh, poor people. And the Bobby they killed, though, 
was not the Bobby I knew four years earlier. Quite a different guy, and I regret now that I didn't uh, have the chance to spend some time with him. But um, I didn't, and uh, they, we buried Martin, that was it. Nine years later, Abernathy calls and says, look, will you do it? Took me six, seven months. He called me in 77, late 77. I, I, I prepared, and finally we went up, and we, um, I spent five hours interrogating James Earl Ray. I came away from that meeting shaken, because this was a diffident guy, passive, d definitely not uh, any more racist than most northern people from Quincy, Illinois would be. No virulence, nothing at all, and the, he, the issues he raised had never been answered. I hope the select committee, which reported in 79, would re answer them. They didn't. I started then going into Memphis very quietly because I, I was troubled by the lack of answers. So that started 78, 79, and here we are, <laughs> 31 years later. And, uh, and I'm trying to put it finally behind me with this third book. And I guess that I, I guess I will do it now. But what it's taught me is you cannot come in and do a quick snapshot investigation of cases as complicated as this. You have to be there for a long period of time. And you have to wait for people to get close to the grave. And even the people you know are the most vicious racists that you can imagine. You keep a civil contact with them. because Someday they may want to come forward and they may want to cleanse their souls in some way before they go up. And that's exactly what's happened. It's what's exactly what's happened. As I started this investigation in 78, I used to meet with Ray, James and Ray, frequently. He kept asking me to take his case. Mark Lane, some of you will know, was a lawyer here from New York and an assemblyman. Mark was his lawyer. Uh, Mark dropped out of the picture at one point. So Ray asked me to represent him, and I uh, refused. I said, until I'm sure, I don't believe you pulled the trigger. He's so dumb when it came to guns. And it, and it just, just, it was unbelievable, dumb. I mean, you know, here's a guy, when he was arrested at Heathrow Airport, he had five bullets in a pistol that they picked up, and the firing pin chamber was empty. And when I pushed him on that, he was so embarrassed, and he said, well, all right. One time, he said, I, I had a pistol in my pocket. I ended up shooting myself in the foot, and I resolved that I would never again keep a fly bullet in the firing pin. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he, was, he just, it's incomprehensible, uncom this guy. He, I knew he wasn't the shooter. I didn't know if he had any knowing involvement, and that took 10 years. 78, 88, took me 10 years to satisfy myself, James Earl Ray was just a patsy. He was someone whom they probably assisted in escaping from uh, the prison in Missouri, and then monitored and put in the hands of a controller and used him at the right time. And as, you, as I followed his movements, I saw they kept him in Los Angeles for a period of time. They moved him into New Orleans. James was pretty well uh, controlled. And eventually, of course, when I discovered that Raul, who was his controller, was a real person who lives about 35 miles from here to this day in Yonkers, New York, which you believe, had been an agency and a, and a, a mob a joint operative for many years coming over from Portugal in 59, that um, uh, w when I identified Raul, and we went through the whole, that whole process of identifying him and having witnesses identify him and a photo spread. Um, I became convinced that James, in fact, was an unknowing patsy. So I agreed to represent him in 88. We went to the, uh, the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm a member of that bar. Uh, we lost. And we went to the Supreme Court with a petition for certiorari. We lost. And they denied it. It looked like the end of the road in terms of, uh, this was in 19, um, 1988, 1990. It looked like we were at the end of the road. And then I came up with an idea that, well, look, 
why don't we try to have a real trial on television, no scripts, heavyweight prosecutor, real defense, heavyweight judge, jury from all over the country, and sure enough, Thames Television in the UK said, yeah, we, we like that idea. Their connections with HBO uh, brought it to happen. And, in, and we had then an opportunity to investigate, go further, and have a trial. We had a trial in 1993, early 1993. Went on for 10 days. The prosecutor was Hickman Ewing, who was Ken Starr's uh, number one or two in, when he went after Clinton. And uh, Hickman was former U.S. attorney in Memphis. Hickman uh, waged a vicious, tough campaign, and he was a hard prosecutor. The judge was Marvin Frankel, former federal district court judge um, in New York. And the jury came from all over the country. They went through, we went through an actual jury selection process, but people from all over the country. Well, the jury, the trial went on for 10 days, took the jury seven and a half hours. They came back and they found James O'Ray not guilty. On the basis of just that evidence that we had at that point in 1993, I thought Hickman was going to have a heart attack because we were sitting there together and all. <laughs> they didn't reveal the verdict to us until April 4, when they televised the, the April, 4, April 4, when they televised in 1993. Um, not guilty. Seven and a half hours, not guilty. Now, that television trial didn't mean anything. In fact, it was poo pooed as, a, oh, just a television trial, entertainment, right? But it did bring people forward. All of a sudden, we started getting calls from this one, people with evidence. So now it started to build uh, uh, of evidence that we didn't have before. So we started interviewing people all over and gathering and developing this evidence. And it also resulted in an, a long article in the Memphis Commercial Appeal by a guy called Steve Tompkins, who's an investigative reporter, who spent 18 months investigating the role of military intelligence infiltrating in the civil rights movement, going back to Dr. King's parents, back into the 20s. This was going forward. This had been going on forever. And Steve revealed that. That was all useful and interesting historically, but what I found most interesting was one little paragraph in that article that said, and there was in Memphis on the 4th of April an Alpha 184 unit, a... Uh, a unit that is normally a sniper unit. And no one has ever explained why they were there. So I went to see Steve, who at that point was working for the governor of Tennessee in Nashville. And um, he didn't want to hear about it. He said, look, Bill, I spent 18 months. These people are scum. They'll kill you as soon as look at you. I said, well, you know, Steve, we got a, I got a guy in prison who's probably innocent. Will you please help me? Finally, I just kept banging on his door and he agreed to help. And what he agreed to do was to go, take qu he didn't know anything about the case, but take questions from me to some of these snipers who were still alive and in a um, particular case were living in Mexico. They had fled the country in s early 70s because they thought there was a, a cleanup operation going on and they had to get out. So he, we did this for 18 months back and forth and back and forth. They would never meet with me because I'm raised a lawyer, but they said they would answer my questions. And they charged us $2,000 a meeting because they had to come from remote areas of Mexico. Well, they laid out their presence in Memphis, where they were, where the two guns were, laid out that Andrew Young was also a target. Each sniper had a spotter, but somehow, the last minute, they were under orders not... They, they, they were briefed at Camp Shelby at 4.30 in the morning, and they were told specifically, shown the photographs of Young and King, that these were their targets, these were enemies of the state, and they had to be eliminated. But they were told you're not to fire until you're given orders by your, your uh, captain. And the head of the team, Billy Ray Hodgson, was to give those orders. They were there in position... They described where Andy Young was, of course, Martin on the balcony, and all of a sudden, there was a shot. 
that shot came, and they didn't know where, but they heard it, and it hit Martin in the jaw, just above the jaw, and of course that was the fatal shot. It was fired from the brush area behind a rooming, uh, the rooming house that uh, sort of was opposite the, the uh, Lorraine Motel. And one of the, one of the guys that they, they just thought the other team had shot first and they just got too anxious or something, but it was very unlike them because they were so highly trained and disciplined. These were special forces guys. But then the next order they received was to disengage and they disengaged and they left, they left the area the same way they came in. What I learned after that was that there were two photographers on the roof of the fire station who filmed everything, still photographs, filmed everything. And they, one of them swept his camera, and the, the reason they were there, by the way, you say, well, why would they want to film? This is crazy. And they, no, the reason they were there was to film everyone and everything that was going on. So if there was anyone who might have seen something he or she shouldn't have seen, a person would have been identified. That's the purpose of that kind of photographic exercise. But one of the guys swept his camera f from the parking lot up into the brush area and actually caught the sniper lowering his rifle and said, it wasn't James Earl Ray. I didn't know who it was, but it definitely wasn't James Earl Ray. So, um, I wanted to get as much as I could from these guys, and I wanted to get the photographs. And so for another year and a half, we negotiated to try to get the damn photographs, because one of them had taken those photographs uh, to Costa Rica. He had, he had a, a separate set of prints there. So Steve was my negotiator on that as well, and one day he made a great mistake. He used his own name going into, uh, uh, going into Florida, into Miami. And his name ticked off um, a surveillance operation. The FBI followed him to where he was meeting um, the photographer. And, and, and they were meeting in a big open area. And as he sat with the photographer, the FBI agent stuck a long lens camera out of uh, the passenger side of their car and the photographer saw it and thought he was being betrayed and being set up and then just split. And so that blew our chance of getting those photographs. But nevertheless, we got the information, because what they saw, because we had been able to talk to the photographers for whatever, whatever, that was, uh, whatever that was worth. So going this route, we slowly picked apart the state's case in terms of the assassination. And it came to a head um, earlier, earlier than later. James had died in 1998. I had published a book in 1995 called Orders to Kill. That auction for that book was won by Harper Collins. Harper Collins, um, of course, as many of you know, was owned by uh, um, Rupert Murdoch. Um, Murdoch had the president of the company call me in London. I had moved my family to London uh, in 1981 as a result of all kinds of harassments and threats in the States following my involvement with the case. So I, th I think I could have little children, uh, a four-year-old son answering the phone, hearing threats against his father's life and seeing uh, uh, guys in duck blinds in the marsh area focusing their cameras on me whenever I left the house, things like that. So I, this is no way for kids to raise, so I, we, we moved to England and um, uh, to Cambridge. And um, so I was, I would, I was commuting, um, I was commuting uh, uh, con uh, continually uh, during the time I did most of this investigation. But the, the, um, the, the, the concept of um, of more and more evidence uh, evolving after orders to kill, Murdoch said, I won't publish your book unless you eliminate the whole chapter on the military. Yeah. You gotta get rid of that. Because I've got an, F I've got an FCC problem uh, taking over Fox, I've got IRS problems in terms of capital gains issues, and it goes to the bottom line of the news corporation. So you've got to 
I can't take on the government. You've got to forget about that. Military, you know it, they didn't do it. You know they were just standbys, backups. You, so what do you need them for? It's a, you know, it was probably a mob contract that did it. And my response was they were so intimately involved that I couldn't leave out that whole thing. And as it turns out, of course, that was the case because the, the colonel, who was a, there was a colonel, John Downey, coordinated the whole operation from the uh, 902nd Military Intelligence Group in the bowels of the Pentagon, the only one that's in the Pentagon. And John Downey coordinated this he had the links to the mob. He, was the, he, he knew everything. Maybe the only person who knew all aspects of this was, was, uh, was Colonel Downey. So I, how do you leave that out? A slight digression. I've come to have very mixed feelings about John Downey. Because uh, in, in 1994, Six, January 1st, 1996, when the book came out, Orders to Kill, Steve got a call from someone saying it was John Downey. He said, I've read Pepper's book. He's basically right, but he's given me too much credit. I want to meet with you and set the record straight. For the next year and a half, nearly two years, meetings were held in Bermuda. I wasn't supposed to be there, so I was on the island quietly, giving Steve information, getting him, and he was supposed to meet with John Downey. Well, John Downey died in 1988 or something like that. He was long gone. And he said to Steve, they're going to tell you I'm dead. They're giving me a new identity and I've been living in Costa Rica ever since and all of that. So it, it, it went on. This was somebody whom they had put in to try to take control of, of the investigation. That's how they work. But I decided some years later, I haven't published this whole thing yet, and a part of it will come out in the book, in the third book. I, I, I decided... I wanted to try to learn more about this guy. So I doorstepped his daughter, who lives in the New York area. And he has two daughters, and one lives in this area. She said she didn't want to talk to me. I said, look, I think there's somebody been impersonating your father, I think he's not doing the family name any good. Would you please just listen to what I have to say? So he invited me in, and I talked to her. And she told me some astounding things. She said to me, she said, you know, um, my father was in Vietnam in 66 when you were there. And I understand he met you. And I said, I don't think so. Cause I think I probably would have remembered him. But she said, yes, yeah, she probably would because he was that kind of charismatic guy. But in any event, he was there. I said, well, what was his job in Vietnam? She said, he was Lyndon Johnson's briefer. In, in, uh, in American intelligence and military circles, and, and in the Russians as well, uh, uh, the rank of colonel is given to an intelligence agent who is assigned to the, um, to the military. And, and the way the American intelligence structure works is that um, the CIA has been given a number of slots in every agency of government in the United States, from interior to customs. I mean, they all have, they're all, uh, to the Justice Department, they're all, they're there. Uh, and the military is no, is certainly no exception. So John Downey was CIA, and he was Johnson's main briefer. He had the military, um, he had the, the, the military cover, but he was the briefer. And I said, and "What did he tell President Johnson about this war?" And she said, "He told Johnson time and time again, what are we to get out of Vietnam? What are we doing there?" This is a waste of blood and treasure, and there's just no reason for us getting involved in an internal national struggle. And Johnson used to ignore this. Ignore it. Finally, one day, she said, Johnson had had enough, and he pounded the table, and he said, John, I cannot get out of Vietnam. My friends are making too much money. When John Downey heard that, she said, his daughter said, she came home that afternoon and said to his wife, pack your bags. We're going to Canada. I'm not having anything more to do with this. And he had himself assigned to Canada. She said, Johnson used to call uh, once or twice a week. I said, where's John? What's he doing? He said, well, he's on special assignment. Yeah, right? So 
all of a sudden, the, 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 this picture of this man changed in my in my mind. Here was a guy um, who was so upset about the corruption and about the waste of human life and uh, the use of misuse of American forces in uh, in Vietnam that he was prepared just to say, "I'm not going to do anything more about this. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I have an oath, and I'm going to follow it." And he left. I said, "But then, how do you explain his role with respect to the killing of Martin King?" She said, "He honestly believed." that Martin King was a danger to the security of the United States. And he had no qualms about organizing that effort because he believed that Martin King was a serious danger. Now, he came from a fairly uh, middle-class area in Pennsylvania. There's a whole cultural thing that goes on there. Uh, so there's not enough to uh, rationalize or to or to, in, in, in any way, of course, uh, sympathize with that kind of attitude that he had about Dr. King. But what, what I'm trying to point out is that there's a, there's a grayness here uh, in terms of the activities of a lot of these people. And that's, that, uh, I have found that with respect to, uh, to Downey in, uh, in particular. He wasn't making money. He wasn't primed to do any of that. He... Um, uh, he, was, he, he was a soldier who was given orders by uh, the Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence, William Yarborough. William Yarborough was the man who gave him the orders to carry out the, organize the assassination of, uh, of uh, Martin King. What Yarborough knew, and Downey didn't necessarily know, was that the FBI had been involved in um, a complementary but similar act plan for quite a period of time. Hoover had identified Dr. King back in the late 50s, middle to late 50s, and he was focused on King as an enemy that he, Hoover, thought had to be gotten rid of. What I've now been able to uncover, which has never been revealed, is the fact that, of course, Hoover's number two, who was also his lover, Clyde Tolson, um, was the man Hoover sent around the country to, with bags of money to pay for uh, some of the worst types of activity you can imagine in terms of killings um, of progressive people in America. Clyde Tolson was very much involved with the people in Memphis, Tennessee, on the ground who uh, carried out the assassination of Martin King. I have photographic evidence now. I have written evidence now. There's no question about that, that Tolson was a major planner in this whole operation. And it had a relationship with these people going back into the, the 50s, if not before. So... Um, the plot, in, 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 a, in a sense, thickens. Martin was killed by a civilian firing from the bushes uh, who was a sharpshooter, Memphis police officer, who was paid a sum of money to do it. He was the mechanic. That's all he was. He was the mechanic. I have, he's alive. Alive and well. And I've confronted him in a non-threatening way. And I've asked him to talk to me. And uh, he said uh, that he would. And then he took off and he missed a meeting. And I found out that he went to visit his son. And uh, some one of my mutual contacts said, well, where do you go? He went to visit his son, a small town in Virginia. His son works in this small town in Virginia. I said, well, where's this? What's this small town in Virginia? He said, it's uh, Langley. Virginia. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I'm still struggling to try at the end of the day to um, uh, to bring that whole thing together and to have this conversation with this man whose name will remain uh, anonymous. He's a very nasty piece of work, very dangerous guy, even at this age. Um, 
but um, we, you know that's that's the kind of end of uh, 31 years of investigation. Where we just we go as far as we can with that, and we draw the we draw the story. The last thing we eventually we finally did with the the case was to have a trial in 1999 that most people don't even know happened. Memphis, Tennessee, 30 days, district court, we had a trial. We brought 70 witnesses. That trial, the transcript of it is, um, used to be on the King's Center website. I think it's all over the place now. All the testimony of those witnesses, I covered, summarized it in Act of State, second book, uh, laid out how Martin King was killed. And it was a trial that the King family brought, and I represented the King family, that case, against uh, Lloyd Jowers. Lloyd Jowers owned Jim's Grill, behind which was the brush area where Martin was shot. Jowers was given the smoking gun by the shooter. He brought it back into the kitchen, broke it down, and uh, we had four or five witnesses finally who nailed Jowers. He was afraid. So he, we sued him in civil court for wrongful death. Um, he agreed to tell us everything that he knew. He didn't. Um, but he told Dexter King, myself, Dexter and Andrew in separate interviews, a great deal about that, about the killing. And he confirmed the shot came from the bushes and all of that. He lied about um, who the shooter was because he knew the shooter was still alive. So he gave the name of another policeman who was there and who went down over the wall, ran up Mulberry Street, got into a police traffic car and was taken away. Taxi cab driver in the driveway of the Lorraine Motel saw this guy come down over the wall and run up. Taxi driver was killed that night, murdered, because he saw something he shouldn't have seen. Um, so the, the Jowers trial went, as I said, for 30 days, took the jury 52 minutes, not seven and a half hours, 52 minutes, and they came back and they found for the King family against Lloyd Jowers and other uh, uh, unknown governmental agents and governmental conspirators. 70% responsibility in terms of damages was placed on the government of the United States, state of Tennessee, city of Memphis, 30% on Lloyd Jowers, because he was just a cog in that whole, that whole uh, operation. So that's the history of, um, I apologize if people have, are aware of those facts and uh, have read the, the, uh, the, the couple of books so far, but that's a summary of, of the history without going into a great deal of the of the detail that uh, came out of uh, what is now 31 years of work. And um, uh, for my sins, I, I have agreed to um, become lead counsel for Sirhan. Sirhan only because they came to me, Sirhan's brother and people advocating him, this case, and they showed me the forensic evidence, the ballistic forensic evidence uh, that made it very clear Sirhan is innocent of the killing of Bob Kennedy. Uh, things like 13 bullets were fired. Uh, Sirhan's gun um, uh, had uh, eight bullets. Uh, things like uh, Bob was shot with four bullets from the rear, all with uh, powder burns in the back, and the one that killed him was within an inch of the, his right ear. Sirhan never was closer than I am to this gentleman in the front row, facing him, never got any closer than that. Um, all of that very clear, hard forensic evidence makes it clear Sir Hannah is innocent. So I've agreed to try to um, um, help in uh, help in that case, and 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 just finish the work on on um, on Martin King's work. Now the the last thing probably gone on much too long, but the last thing um, that is of important in terms of Martin King's work is the whole idea of a people's movement, of a um, bringing of a massive amount, number of people uh, to Washington. I think the, uh, the days of this republic, as we have known it, those of us who are a certain age who have grown up in it, or imagined it, uh, are numbered. Um, 
I don't think there's, um, there's uh, much doubt about that. This administration, um, far from changing uh, policies of the, uh, the Bush government, has perpetuated them and even gone further in terms of uh, calling for the use of uh, illegal detention, indeterminate detention of uh, people who are involved in dissent and uh, being able to classify them as unlawful uh, combatants. Um, there is no, there is no let up, there is no change in the assault on, on uh, human rights and civil liberties in this country, um, rather the, to the contrary. The forces that have run this republic uh, for as long as any of us can imagine still run this republic. And they're, they are becoming more isolated, but also more powerful in terms of the accumulation of wealth to the detriment of masses of people who once thought they were middle-class Americans and are now finding that they're not only middle-class Americans, but they don't have homes, they don't have shelters. And the mass media and, um, um, for the most part, the Hollywood film images are tending to produce uh, uh, easy educational images of, a, of the American dream and the American Republic. You know, I was, uh, I commented the other day, I think, to Frank that I was amazed that I had to learn, maybe you, many of you didn't, but I had to learn about Mr. Roosevelt's final uh, State of the Union address from Michael Moore, where he called the cameras in and proposed a second Bill of Rights to the American people back in 1944, which included, of course, universal health care, uh, shelter for every American, job entitlement for every American. And there goes Mr. Roosevelt down this list in his uh, very weakest point as proposing this second Bill of Rights. And we, you know, we grow up and we never learn about, the, uh, about this urging. I knew, um, um, I came to know um, Kathy Douglas very well, Justice Douglas's fourth wife, because Bill Douglas used to send her wherever I would go, because he had read stuff I'd written and was very interested. And Kathy kept passing me notes to come visit the justice, and I never would go. Years later, in the 80s, she said to me, well, after he had died, why didn't you come? Bill wanted to talk to me. I said, but Kathy, they were trying to impeach him for marrying you. He was 66, she was 22, and it was a wonderful marriage, and she was very happy. And he, uh, but they were trying to impeach him. And this was, again, Hoover, and he used Jerry Ford. Was Jerry Ford was Hoover's lapdog. And uh, to introduce the bill... Of, uh, of impeachment and push it against uh, Bill Douglas. And at one point, Douglas was interviewed late in his life and, because Roosevelt asked him to run with him the last time, and he refused because it was going to split the party. The Prendergast machine wanted Truman. And Douglas was asked, how would the world have been different? Well, he started off by saying, well, Hiroshima and Nagasaki would not have occurred because the Japanese, we knew, were were trying to sue for peace months before that. But the talk in the Oval Office focused on the Soviet Union and how to send a message to the Soviet Union. And we sent a message to the Soviet Union by killing hundreds of thousands of innocent Japanese civilians. That kind of mentality has dominated American foreign policy throughout my entire life. I don't know about you. And that's not going to change unless there is a people's movement that comes to the fore and organizes and compels the change. Now we're not, we're talking about the reliving, the restructuring of Martin King's dream of a poor people's campaign. But we should be talking about a million, a million and a half, two million people coming to Washington or the environs and staying there and trying to force through the sheer weight of their presence and their numbers a change in this structure, which is nothing less than a revolutionary change. Now, it should all be done, in my view, under the push for a constitutional convention. 
for a, because that's legal. American citizens can do that. There's a whole procedure for constitutional convention. Frank has just given me this, the um, uh, petition and call, which um, uh, I have to take some responsibility for, which um, calls for that kind of convocation of people from all over the country. Now, funding that is the major obstacle. How do you fund that? How do you bring million, two million people to Washington? How do you house them? It's a tent city. That's what Martin talked about. But we don't have Martin. How do we do it? How do you bring them there? Just the sheer number of buses and transport alone is, is mind-boggling in terms of cost. My response to that is, we don't use buses. We don't use cars. We have departure points, maybe 10 of them, all over the country, in every region. And people start to walk. And they walk. And they walk. The masses of Americans walk. And can you imagine the numbers that will come at each stop in the road? They walk from Washington, from Sacramento, from Atlanta, from Birmingham. And here they're walking, all walking. For what purpose? to lead a nonviolent, peaceful revolution, to take back this country, and to take back its government, and to try to do it before it's too late. So what are they going to do? They're going to lock everybody up? They can't do it with those numbers. They can pick off the leadership, and they can put the leaders over. They can disappear them, no question about that. But as soon as they disappear, one group of leaders, others are going to come. They cannot stop this. But the key is to develop organizations in every state and every county who are prepared to go this route. Now, logistically, every stop along the way, there, has, there have to be tents and there has to be, log there has to be food. What, that, that all has to be worked out. And groups like Picture the Homeless all over this country have experience in doing that on a smaller scale. So that now has to be extrapolated into a major, major operation. If we don't do it, we're gone. Any sense of democracy in this nation is gone. And we will be overridden by the same power structures that have dominated this country forever. When Obama became president, there was a great deal of hope. The liberal side of me said, you know, isn't this wonderful? Maybe this guy will do something. And I stepped back. And he appointed Larry Summers and Tim Geithner. He didn't even think of Joe Stieglitz, you know, or Paul Krugman, who themselves are quasi-establishment uh, types, but who have a totally different view of how to deal with the economic problems of this country. Yeah, no, it was, it was the old boys hands-on again at the switch running things. And then he put John Brennan in. My goodness. And if you read the New York Times, did a piece on Brennan in, the, in its uh, magazine section today. What they don't tell you is that John Brennan was the architect, the architect of the kidnappings of hundreds and hundreds of people through the program of extraordinary rendition that he ran for the CIA. And that's why they couldn't put him forward as head of the CIA, because there was enough opposition to him, because he ran extraordinary rendition. He's a war criminal. Absolute war criminal. And now he's the head of counterterrorism. I don't need to go down the list of the other appointments. But it's business as usual. There is this fear. There's, there is this absolute fear of 200 guys in caves that they call Al-Qaeda. <laughs> that they are going to somehow, they have, the, they, have, they, they have the stature that the Soviet Union had during the Cold War with all of this propaganda. But they're there, and we have to be worried about those guys. No, it's a whole media blitz. The administration is part and parcel of it, and it's not going to stop unless the people of this country stop it. That was the message that Martin King gave us 
back in 1967-68. And that's the message that a little quiet guy who stood in a corner of a room in 1959 when I was in, in uh, Cuba. I was a baseball player. Two of us from Colombia were chosen to go and play in a sports festival in Cuba and, uh, in 1959. And we met uh, Fidel, of course, and uh, Raul. But the guy who impressed me the most was that little guy who stood in the back of the room. He was so quiet. And I had to go to him and pull things out of him because he was avoiding the limelight. And uh, to this day, that little guy and his analysis, you know, he was a medical doctor from Argentina, became known, uh, Ernesto Guevara became known as Che Guevara. His words stay with me, and that's the, the only message. You know, imperialism will go of its own weight, of its own greed, and in its own time. But if it's given a push by the people who are within it and exploited by it, like the Haitian people did. The only people in the history of the world whom a slave revolt resulted in the creation of a new state. And look at the misery we have visited upon them. I talked to Bishop Gumbleton about two days ago, who's an old Haiti hand. He had been to South Africa and was spending time with Aristide. Aristide, as you probably know, was elected president of Haiti, who had a vision for his people that ran contrary the vision of American corporate interests. So Bill Clinton had him removed and taken away. So, uh, and Gumbleton says, you know, he yearns to come back, but of course he knows they will likely kill him if he does. But those people historically created a republic from the uh, ashes of French exploitation and imperialism. Hopefully, we may be able in this country to gal galvanize enough people to create that kind of movement here before it's too late. You know, as Guevara said, hasta la victoria siempre, por los pobres de la tierra, for the poor people of the earth, increasingly the poor people of this republic, let us hope something like that can take off. Thank you. <laughs> when there was the original debate between President Kennedy and, and President Nixon or whatever, and it was said that Kennedy had this wonderful appeal, and that, and I said this before, that television became a babysitter for children, that they took cigarettes off the air, and they made Sesame Street, and they fixed television so that you could put your first grader in front of it and leave them there. But what I really believe is that as Dr. King, what at that time they caught the media and you would have your child turn on the TV. I watched Dr. King on television. He was very charismatic. He was beautiful, he was charming. And all of the beautiful, charismatic, charming people are dead. And they are continuing to use television, television to broadcast Al-Qaeda, to broadcast the enemy, to broadcast the war. So I, I have given up television because it, it's very clear to me that television has been, um, you know, skewed, obviously skewed in, in that direction. Yeah, I, 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 I applaud you <laughs> giving up television. <laughs> it's, it's um, I mean, if you had a question as to what I think of that. I mean, I think obviously that's um, it's a, it's an important commitment, but I said that they said that Dr. King was dangerous, and and I believe that his ability to capture television yeah. was fantastically dangerous. Yeah, but you can't. Uh, the, the, the media control today is more extensive than it e has ever been in in our. I remember that when there was the original debate between President Kennedy and, and President Nixon or whatever, and it was said that Kennedy had this wonderful appeal. And that, and I said this before, that television became a babysitter for children. That they took cigarettes off the air, and they made Sesame Street, and they fixed television so that you could put your first grader in front of it and leave them there. But what I really believe is that as Dr. King, what at that time they caught the media, and you would have your child 
turn on the TV. I watched Dr. King on television. He was very charismatic. He was beautiful. He was charming. And all of the beautiful, charismatic, charming people are dead. And they are continuing to use television, television to broadcast the Al Qaeda, to broadcast the enemy, to broadcast the war. So I, I have given up television because it, it's very clear to me that television has been, um, you know, skewed, obviously skewed in, in that direction. Yeah, I, 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 I applaud you <laughs> giving up television. It's, it's um, I mean, if you had a question as to w w what I think of that, I mean, I think obviously that's, um, it's, a, it's an important commitment, but... I said that they said that Dr. King was dangerous, and, and I believe that his ability to capture television yeah. was fantastically dangerous. Yeah, but you can't, uh, the, the, the media control today is more extensive than it has ever been in, in our lifetimes. You know, there was a time back in the 60s, 67, in particular in 68, in that period of time, where you could get a window uh, for some of the things, type of things that I'm talking about. Not revolution, but uh, some of the evils. I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, Look Magazine. How many, of you, how many of you ever heard of Look Magazine? Ah, okay, most of you do. Huh? Look and Life. Look and Life. But I'm talking about Look. I'm talking about Look. Look Magazine back in 67 had as its editor a man called William Atwood, Bill Atwood. He was uh, very close to Kennedy's. He, he was actually Kennedy's ambassador to Kenya at one point in time. Bill Atwood had an associate editor called Chandler Broussard. Chandler Broussard came to me and said, we want to do, uh, we want to republish your Ramparts piece in Look so the masses of Americans will see that piece. And I said, well, that would be a first. That's, that's marvelous if you want to do that. Um, that's different than my having lunch with Mike Wallace and we almost came to blows, <laughs> which, happened, which happened up on 57th Street. But um, so um, uh, I said, OK. So I came along. They invited me. I came along to see Bill Atwood over at Look. And I go into Look. I'm this young kid, right? And I go into Look. And, uh, and he said, for lunch. And he said, gee, it's good to see you. And thank you for coming. And he said, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know I had um, a visitor last week concerning this visit we're having. I said, well, who was that? He said, uh, Averill Harriman. I said, oh, Governor Harriman. And you all know who Governor Harriman is, I suppose, right? Or many of you do. Maybe many don't. He was uh, governor of the state of New York. He ran for the presidency. He was ambassador uh, to the Soviet Union. Uh, so he was a doyen uh, leader of the Democratic Party. So, so he, said, he said, yeah, Harriman flew in from Washington to see me. I said, oh, why did he come in to see? He said, well, he came in, and the first thing he said was, I want to bring you greetings from the President of the United States, who uh, wishes you well and hope that everything is fine with you and your family, and all that. And Atwood said, yes. And he said, now, why are you here? He said, well, I'm here because the President would be very grateful uh, to you if you would never publish anything that Bill Pepper wrote. <laughs> so Atwood says to me, she says, you know, you should really be chuffed about that. Here's, you know, the President of the United States, you're, you're, you know, very young guy, and he's saying he doesn't want anything published that you, that you write. I said, well, that's interesting, Mr. Atwood, but I'm more interested in what you said to Governor Harriman. <laughs> he said, well, I told him that we were going to meet with you next week, and um, if I believed in what you were saying and your documentation and photographs and all of that, we were going to publish. And then I said to him, and by the way, give the president my best regards. Now, that was a guy who had a whole, you know, you had a chance with someone like Bill Atwood who was able to get into that position of power. Never get there again. I'll tell you the, long, the end of that story is a week later, Chandler, love him, uh, he's passed away within the last year, I guess. Chandler brought um, Jim Garrison up from New Orleans. And Garrison's meeting with Atwood went uh, uh, late afternoon through dinner into the evening. And uh, Chandler told me that um, about one o'clock in the morning, um, Bill called, uh, Bill Atwood called Bob Kennedy. And he said, Bobby, I've just uh, had um, uh, the New Orleans district attorney here 
and he has shown me a remarkable proof that the, the involvement of the American intelligence establishment and the CIA in particular in the assassination of your brother. And Bobby's response was, yes, we know that, but I have to get control of the White House, first instance. That was 1 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning, Bill Atwood had a heart attack and was rushed to a hospital, never again returned as uh, editor of Look Magazine. Chandler Broussard was fired. Needless to say, neither my piece or Garrison's were ever showed up. Now that's, that's a side story, but the idea was that at least back in those days, you had a chance to do that. I ran into Brian Gumbel on the Today Show and probably cost him his job. Uh, we, they eventually pushed him out into the wilderness because it, Bryant was very hostile during the first segment, seven minute segment. But as he asked very hostile questions and I answered them with detail, when the segment was over, he said to me, this was 19, this was 1992, three. He said to me, will you stay for another segment? And I said, well, you have another guest, I'm sure. He says, yes, but that's no, all right. We'll deal, we'll put that away. And I had then two successive segments with him. And the second one, he then proceeded to draw out uh, and elaborate on information that I was giving. And that, you know, that was something that his career could not, in my view, ultimately stand. And so they moved him out, CBS, and then out to whatever he's doing now. I, I had one interview with, and this is in more recent times, with his fellow uh, Anderson Cooper at CNN. And he asked um, a number of questions. I answered them. He had a Memphis DA on, and at one point he was so flabbergasted. He never heard any of this stuff. And he said to the Memphis DA, he said, well, you know, what do you say about this? This is a guy who's not making any money out of this. I mean, my investigation of the King case over the first 25 years cost me $1 million out of my own pocket. Nobody else can pay for that. I had to do that. So I had to earn it and spend it. So uh, Cooper says, you know, what do you say? This, what's this? He's not, he seems sincere, he's not lying, he has evidence, and the guy waffled at the other end, but it was over, Cooper just shook his head, but I will guarantee I would never be back. At this point in time, you don't get back on those things, you know, and I've had uh, other hosts tell me, uh, it's just not worth our job. <laughs> they, they're, the control now, the consolidation of control of information, and these issues is so tight that you can't expect anything from mainstream media and you also can't expect much from the alternative media who are being infiltrated by contributions from foundations and other, other, uh, other sources of income. So it's, it is a problem and I don't know quite how you, how you deal with that but it is a, it is a problem today. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Dr. where very small groups of people with a lot of wealth and money could control the policy decisions. And we are, we are clearly, we're, we're clearly at that point now. I don't think there's any question of that. So I think uh, King would not be acceptable unless he were to renounce, unless he, were, unless he would renounce his basic values and, and, and premises, and then he would not be the Martin King we know and Revere. With respect to um, uh, the what? Manchurian candidate. Yeah, no, the man, King was not killed by a Manchurian candidate. Killed, King was killed by a contract killer, knew exactly what he was doing. He's a racist guy um, who had no problems in killing King and no problems in collecting the money for doing it. On the other hand, 
Bob Kennedy was killed by um, by um, a person who also was not a Manchurian candidate, but but Sirhan was clearly programmed to such an extent uh, that I can't go into a great deal of detail, but we've been trying to restore his memory now for two years. He was heavily programmed uh, to be the patsy to distract attention so that King could be, uh, Kennedy could be shot from behind. His, from behind. Respect to Bilderberg and these kinds of organizations, um, all of these forces in the world who control, uh, the, who dominate the economic plans of this planet you know, are represented on a whole range of, uh, of operations like the Bilderbergs and the Trilateral Society and all of that. There's no question about that. Uh, are they insidious in terms of planning all kinds of things? I think that they are more supportive and, and uh, they, they represent the powerful and the wealthy that, throughout the world, not just in the United States. Yeah. Lynn, and then that fellow back there. Uh, I work at Pictures and I agree with you that um, there are a lot of grassroots <coughs> organizations around the country that could be really excited about descending on Washington and having a tent city. But I was wondering, in your opinion, are there any civil rights leaders from um, uh, King's generation, whether it's Joseph Lowry, John Lewis, any of them who would be also interested in collaborating? Joseph Lowry, no. John Lewis, no. Um, Reverend James Lawson, yes. Uh, I think it's time to look for grassroots leaders, new people, uh, who are not tainted uh, with the history and the corruption of the past that has taken over. I think Jim Lawson is a very unusual man of high integrity, and so he's like a senior um, mentor who would, uh, who would be there. But not, not Lewis, definitely not Lewis, and not, uh, and not, uh, any of those, those other folks, in my view, no. Gentlemen there? Yeah. Hi, Bill. Uh, I'm Peter Steele, a student of yours at Manhattan Community College. That's a long time. In 1967, yeah. <laughs> so I'm familiar with your, your Rampart uh, articles. And, uh, and then I was also with you when you worked with the Committee with a responsibility, which you didn't tell about, Trap and Kwan. Uh, right. I heard from the grapevine that Bill raised him, but he went back when he was, his arms and legs were blown out. He had no legs and one arm, and uh, he was 11 years old running cigarettes for his mom from the north to the south. And. Uh, he got picked up by the Committee of Responsibility and taken to Boston Children's Hospital. So then, he, he's a really genius kid. He, uh, he solicited all these rich matrons up there, and they gave him money because they felt bad. He went back to the Boston Children's Hospital, and he became a money lender, where he was giving 10-year-old kids $10 for <laughs> for 12, you know, and he wanted to be a pimp, drive a Cadillac, he was 13. Bill took him to his house in, in Asimov, and uh, Bill's kids, he had about 15 of them, he was like Angela Jolie back then, and Brad Pitt, he had about 30 kids, and uh, from all over the world. And uh, they, they kissed this kid's ass for about two days. And on the third day, they made him clean the bathroom. And he was the, the best 